So welcome, and thank you for attending this session. Um, we will be talking about improving embedded system boot time, but actually a word has missed from the title, and uh, that is Android. Uh, so uh, mainly I'm focused on the Android uh, boot time issue. Um, so few words about me. I am a physicist, or at least I was a physicist. I work on the autonomous navigation of light and then air systems for planetary exploration. And since 2009, I'm working on Android Embedded. Welcome, guys. So you can. Thanks. OK, people are still joining. Um, so I'm working on the Embedded platform uh, since 2009. And <clears throat> I'm the, currently the CEO of Kinetics, a company based in Santa Clara, California. And one of my you know, favorite hobby is to work with retro computing. I, I don't know if any one of you guys actually is passionate about, but I like to restore old Atari 2600 Sunnyvale, heavy duty, 9077, <laughs> so that particular model, and uh, you know, and writing some assembly code. I guess it's great to have that control of the machine that sometimes in, nowadays in the in, in embedded system that we are used to, you know, it's. It's much more complexity, but you know, a lot of easier things to do. Um, so today we will be talking, uh, you know, about Android and the uh, optimization of the operating system by hibernation. Uh, so we will take a look to the Android boot sequence first, um, and uh, what are the optimization that you can do on the cold boot. So using like standard techniques. Uh, then we will be talking about hibernation and in particular using the, um, the, the kernel feature uh, software suspend. Uh, and uh, we will have some examples, real example based on the um, IMAX 8 mini uh, SO, um, chip uh, SOC by uh, NXP um, working with a particular board that is featuring this chip. Uh, first of all, uh, how many of you are a platform, an Android platform developer? Okay, like a decent number. And how many of you have programmed Android from an application standpoint? Okay, so um, as you know, Android is really common. You know, if you use, you can use Android in different embedded products. And uh, in my experience, I've seen, pro, you know, products like embedded devices for medical applications or um, spectrometer, uh, scientific like type of tools that, because they want a fancy UI, they are targeting Android. Um, some of the things that was really cool about Android back in time was that anyone can be an Android developer because the language and the entire SDK was on a sandbox. And that kind of easy way of developing software was also, on the other side, a nightmare to work on the platform itself. And, uh, you know, you guys are maybe familiar with the boot sequence and why Android is taking so much time to boot. Uh, of course, there are some common ground with Linux. <clears throat> so we have, of course, like the, the booting sequence from the boot ROM of the, of the chip, uh, the bootloader, the kernel, the init. And then from the init, you have a lot of daemons that are launched. And this is how actually Linux works, right? And then you have a system ready to, to go. Instead, Android adds a lot of other components because Android is a sort of sandbox for developers to develop JVM-based uh, programs. And part of the services that are system, um, uh, that are part of the system, are developed in Java. So part of those are like uh, native uh, uh, programs, and part of, the, of others, uh, like the power management, is, is done in Java. 
uh, here is like a comparison uh, between <clears throat> Linux and, 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 and Android. And of course, uh, as, as I said before, um, to the init, th that is like common ground. But then uh, we have a couple of things that are happening uh, on, on Android that makes the platform completely different. And by the way, the, the operating system is completely different too, is a more remote procedure call uh, kind of operating systems. It's not really like Linux where you, you know, if you want to modify some daemon uh, components, you have some configuration file. Yeah, you have configuration file, init file on specific, but there's a lot of things that happens in the code. So you gotta actually look into the code to modify some aspects of the, of the, of the system services, native or, or Java. This is a very popular uh, picture uh, from Karim Yagmur, uh, one of the main experts on, on the field of the, of the Android uh, platform. And you can read this picture like um, uh, clock, uh, uh, counterclockwise. So you start from the CPU, the bootloader, the kernel, and init system. Much more common ground with Linux, native daemons, but what actually kicks in and is different is what we call the zygote and the Android runtime. So um, because everything is handled by a virtual machine, zygote is in charge to fork itself uh, using some kind of lazy copy mechanism so we don't run out of memories if we are launching like hundreds of applications. Uh, and so every time you wanna launch an app, a Java app or a Kotlin app, uh, you are forking uh, Zygote all the time. Uh, after, you know, we have an important block are the system server. The system server includes a lot of services that you are actually using on the phone, like the battery manager, and everything is really also close to the hardware. And then, of course, you end up on the launcher that is where you land all the time that you power on your um, Android phone. So in this really complex picture, you know, there were like several ways of optimizing the boot. And um, you know, uh, there is a lot of work that has been done um, from 2011. There was a, a very uh, uh, popular presentation done by Tim Bird that everyone I think knows here, right? And uh, uh, he was trying to identify what has, you know, what, what you could do, could do on, the, on the system to make this boot sequence a little bit faster. So now that we introduce a little bit of the uh, components, right? So we, we can read, you know, these, these lines trying to, you know, understand what was the advantage. So starting zygote as early as possible, right? And that was especially slow if you were working with encrypted partitions. So if you move, so data usually can be encrypted, and then if you move partition um, for, for the classes that he's reading to, to, from data to cache, you can save time because you don't have to decrypt those class files. Um, uh, make, it, make parallelize the package manager service. Every time you start Android, you scan all the packages installed. So if you're running these things on multiple threads, you can do it faster. Uh, you can split classes by importance. So what is needed by the system server, right? So what is part of the system, or what would be something related to the apps. Or uh, because you want to show up the, the GUI immediately, right? Uh, so you want to give the user the gratification of having the launcher like in front of him like as soon as possible. Uh, you can do some prioritization, prioritization, sorry, uh, on the on the system services like bringing the window manager immediately in front of the user. Uh, but with all this work, that is like a decent amount of work, right? It's not really. Uh, there is a lot of things that you gotta fix on your um, system image, uh, you get like 30% of boot time reduction. Uh, so 
I want to introduce like a use case that for me at least was really important and I was you know, also looking at customers, try, I was trying to identify how they were using uh, Android. And most of those systems in the embedded like space, right, I'm not talking about phones, um, is a kiosk type of system. So you have just one application and you know, that application is basically doing everything, uh, like talking to other like components, of course, but you know, that is where the user lands after, um, after the, the boot. So I, I want to just introduce like what I call, what, not me, just me, but you know, it's a common term, uh, but I want to just to, to define that, uh, that is called the single image mode. So single image mode, um, so if you are working on a specific context, uh, what if you create a snapshot of that initial state and every time you boot the system, you just load that particular state. So it's a kind of different use case between um, laptop computers or phones um, and embedded systems. But in this case, uh, you don't have to hibernate, and we will go into the details all the time, from different states or let the user to hibernate the, the system from a different states, uh, but just you, have one state you want to land, let's say the Android launcher, and you want to, the user from there can, you know, take the control. Or you may select another state, like the application already opened, like the custom application, the kiosk application already opened, like opened, and then you want the user to land there after uh, booting the, uh, the system. So this is <coughs> kind of the picture. Uh, so if we have a system in a consistent state, that means that it's like a, qu a quiet state, and we create a single image by hibernation, and then we store the image on a swap partition. That, by the way, we have to create a swap partition on, 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 on the system, and then we power off. Then every time we, we can uh, tell the kernel, every time you boot, you just go and, and, and load and resume that particular image from the swap partition. So you power on, you load the image from the swap, you store, restore the image in memory, and you, know, you have the consistent final state that actually is the same of the consistent initial state. And you loop, that is the use case that your device will be like executing all the time. So <clears throat> maybe worthy just to rem, you know, recall some, some power states that are like really common. The first two are really not in the space we are interested. The suspend to idle and the standby. Uh, instead, the, the more common uh, suspend state that you are um, uh, experiencing on your Android device is the suspend to RAM. So when you press the power button, uh, you know, it, it, uh, um, uh, a wake clock has been released and the, the, the system goes into suspend to RAM and then we click back again, the, the system is back. And the system is not off. So the use case we want to achieve is just we want to unplug the power. And in this case, the memory is kept, of course, powered. And then we have the hibernation. So kernel stops all the system activities uh, and creates a snapshot image of the memory, everything, and he writes on a persistent storage. That can be SD card or eMMC. Uh, power off is not mandatory in general for hibernation. You can hibernate and don't, you know, empower the device. Uh, so you can stop the, 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 the hibernation flow before sending a power off event actually to the system. But this is what I, we wanted to achieve. So we want to like power off the entire system. Um, so a, a, everything that you do on a particular platform is really dependent on the particular SOC that you are like using in your single board computer, in your dev kit, in your um, uh, system in general where you are developing. 
so everything is really tied to the lowest um, level of the system. And of course, um, you got to deal with a lot of uh, things at the, at the kernel level. Uh, so uh, right now, the, the power management uh, has been almost like divided between two models, what we call the system slip model that includes the suspend to RAM, suspend to disk, and the runtime slip model that is the suspend to idle. So if you look at the kernel and drivers, you will see uh, these two distinction when they are present. And this is done on the device or the, um, like um, bus or, or class driver, uh, implementing function to take care of what is happening when you suspend the system, hibernate the system, and when you uh, reboot and restore, restore everything. Um, so usually, uh, if you're familiar with how drivers are developed, what you see is there are a lot of callbacks. In particular, in the last line, you see uh, a structure that you know, goes from the device, to the platform driver, to the power management, uh, um, to the power management um, element of the structures that actually points to all uh, the uh, defined functions, callbacks to handle um, that are passed to the power manager of the Linux power manager. In particular, um, you know, we, we are using software suspend. So software suspend is um, like a kernel program feature, which is part of the power management, power management since the kernel 3.8. And uh, uh, this is the default framework that everyone now, nowadays is, uh, is using. And uh, um, there are different stages. So when you go through the uh, hibernation flow, uh, you gotta take care of different stages. So first of all, you wanna create an image. Uh, and so you have a sort of callbacks to prepare that state. And then you have the, um, the, the freeze callbacks that, that stops, stop the system, right? And then you wanna save the image, so you need the system again. Right, because you gotta write something. So you you want to take a picture of the system, but then you gotta write the image somewhere, and so you cannot do that if you are like in a deep deep sleep state. So you do a sort of defreezing again, and then you call the power off. So if you go around like the, the, the kernel sources, uh, you gotta take care that this workflow is, is done right. And again, there is no magic sauce. Um, we will be talking a little bit about uh, this even during the presentation, but um, if you are working with a specific chip vendor, probably you are working with the kernel that is provided by the chip vendor. And uh, usually this is, not, this is not a mainline kernel. Uh, usually it doesn't work like really well. It depends, it did, they, they didn't test everything, right? And so, everything is really platform specific. There is no magical way to, to do that once and then you know, apply, even from the same vendor, you have different chips, so different SOC, uh, with different version of Android, and we will see how different version of Android, they carry a different version of the kernel. And their things are different, then you have also uh, components like the GPU that changes. So uh, the code of the GPU driver in kernel space, it's different from the previous version of the same GPU device. And so again, even in the same family, it's not really straightforward. Um, so one thing is work your driver's power management operations. Um, so some devices may have not that, that done right. And it really depends also on the use case, what, have you, what you have to bring back from hibernation, right? So you have to just figure it out immediately what is your uh, state, the, 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 the initial state, right? You remember when you wanna take a picture of the system and what are the devices that are involved and you wanna bring back to work, to life, right? So, um, and drivers are implemented in different ways. There are, there are different, uh, different ways, flavors, that developers do drivers. Uh, one of the things that is really 
should be a standard way is to implement the uh, power management operation um, uh, using the power management operation structure that is defined into, uh, into the kernel. Some driver, they can still do the old way to, to define the suspend and resume operation inside the driver structure, but it's not really standard. And also, in the power manager, if you go around uh, in the, I guess, the pm.h uh, definition file, um, you will see there are a lot of macros that you can use to save a lot of typing, right, to pass to the system, to the power management, the callbacks that you defined at the driver level. So, um, this is a picture that just like summarized what we have been talking. So you want to hibernate, so you freeze the system, um, and you want to create the image, but then you defreeze the system, and you want to write the image into the, into the swap memory. And, you know, we have to figure out how this flow is handled by all the devices that you want to bring back to life. And some of those may be easy, but again, they depend on the platform you're working on, on the version of the kernel you're working on, and some of others may be less easy, especially when the system is dependent on user space blobs that is really popular nowadays from chip, make, chip makers, right? They don't want to give you the secret sauce of some components, so it's not open, and you got to live with this. Uh, this is the restore flow, so it's basically we, we go back, so um, you know, we wake up the system, we freeze it, um, and then because we got to start from where we, we are supposed to bring back the system, and then we restore everything in memory. Um, so it's just the reverse process that we did, uh, we did before. There is also things that you have to do at the Android level. So Android has to be put in the consistent state that we were talking before. So um, we want to remove unwanted wake locks, and uh, we want to force all the threads to release semaphores because there is, uh, I'm, I'm talking about Android semaphores, not uh, Linux semaphores. Um, eventually, when you bring up the GUI, you may have some noise around because uh, the GPU may cache something that, is not, has be, that has, has not been discharged, and then you have some like pixelation or some, something that is not looking right. You, you may want to repaint something at the uh, surface flinger level. Um, you want to eventually look for pending surface flinger transaction. This, is, this goes back to um, to what is the state I'm taking the picture, right? So again, it may be easy for certain states, but if you go into more uh, application-dependent uh, initial state, you may have to take care of this. And of course, uh, the sync between the hardware composer and the surface flinger. And the bad news is that uh, at that level, so the abstraction layer of the, uh, of the Android uh, user space between um, uh, the low, low level hardware and the user space, there is a glue, right, that may be not open source. So it's proprietary, but still you have the code, so you can look into the code, or maybe not. They are just binary blobs. So let's go back to, to that concept, right? Code ones just run there. Yeah, that's that, you know, but, but the beauty of having Java running on Android is fantastic, but at the system level, it's, it's not like that at all. So every time, um, you know, every, so kernel and, uh, and Android user space are tightly coupled. There is nothing that you can do. So you got to redo the job all the time uh, and try to understand how changed, what changed in the driver at the driver level and take care of of what we have been talking, right? Uh, the power management of the of each device, um, and so we gotta rework some features uh, to the particular Android version. Uh, uh, for example, Android nine on the IMX eight um, is using the kernel four fourteen, uh, 
Android 8 was using uh, kernel 4.9, right? So the code base may be different, and what is different for sure is the GPU kernel driver. So the GPU is evolving from product to product, especially when you change family of microprocessors, you switch from an IMX6 to an IMX8, even if the GPU may be the same in terms of performances, the code may be like quite different. And some components uh, that I was uh, mentioning before, uh, they may be uh, totally binaries. So what if something is not going to work, or is not working, and you need to debug? There is no way you can debug. And I, I remember that I, we were like frustrated um, at a certain point that we were thinking about having some open platform where even the Admore Composer or the GPU were completely uh, open, and so we can actually look into the code and, and, and debug and trace what was happening. Because we are talking about tracing the system and debug the system, you know, not only putting the, you know, print K around the, the code, but also trying to have a picture of what is, is called and when in, in the system, and so having, having something more as a, as a big picture before going into the, the detail. These are typical examples of things that are really closed, like uh, the GPU, uh, hardware acceleration, um, hardware composer abstraction layer, uh, the OpenGL, um, um, the OpenGL um, libraries, um, GPU dependent, of course. Um, so we we wanted to ex do some 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 tests on the newest platform from NXP, and in particular the um, the uh, IMX. Um, uh, 8M Mini. So the IMAX 8M Mini is right now the cheapest. Uh, it's today we are like doing a lot of development uh, around the Mini. is a very popular SOC um, uh, used by many customers. And in particular, we were be we were using the uh, boundary devices uh, Nitrogen M Mini. So Nitrogen is like a serial, uh, like a sort of um, uh, hardware, uh, single board computers uh, that features different microprocessors. Uh, one of the most popular was the Nitrogen 6 that was uh, featuring the uh, IMX6 Quad. And this, may, this seems to be a very successful product too. Uh, the sweet thing is that he has like um, an EMMC or SD card, but we can use the EMMC, and he has two gigs of RAM. RAM, <laughs> it's like an interesting point because when you want to hibernate something, you need RAM. You don't need double of the RAM, but you need RAM to prepare, right? So you have a running system and you gotta prepare. So allocate pages, allocate pages to have that image then persisted. So again, if you have like a 512 megabyte system, you may have some problems and then you got a free memory somewhere else on the system. I guess the CMA, it's probably something that you want to look at immediately to, to, to just free some memory. Like many SOC allocate too much CMA memory, right, for DMA. So probably something that is worthy to take a look. Um, we, were, we, we were using the Android uh, 9 uh, with a kernel 414. Uh, so it was interesting to start with no hibernation um, image optimization. Um, the, was, uh, there was a great talk yesterday uh, by a colleague here that was uh, talking how to make this really performant, right? And uh, um, for uh, minimizing the stress, of course, on the NAND, and also for having less data to load. Uh, there is something that you can do off the shelf from the kernel that is like the, the dump cache. So there is something that you can do from the sys file system, so you say dump the cache and see. But we didn't see so many improvement. Our image has already uh, 125K uh, pages, right? One page is um, uh, 496, um, so for, for, for um, 4096 bytes. Uh, and uh, pretty much was consistent even trying changing the, the dump cache parameter. 
Um, but we were more focused on bringing back the system. So there is a lot of work to do still there. Um, again, it, it requires less memory allocation um, because we have more RAM available. Uh, and so this is like a good thing to, to do some tests with. And we add like a, a boot time of 12 seconds. So again, you can, the important here is to say that the image is, has been loaded from the kernel. So you power on the board, you boot starts, and then the kernel kicks in, and the kernel loads the uh, image from, um, from, from the swap partition, right? In this like, workflow, we reach like a time of uh, 12, uh, 12 seconds. Uh, let me say if. This is a video that actually shows you. So this is the kernel stage, right? So here we are loading the uh, the image from the from 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 the uh, swap partition, and then we are loading the system like on the launcher. We we found this to be the consistent state we want to start working with, right? And so we have like a time around 11, 12 seconds. That uh, is like from 40 seconds to 12 seconds, it's like a great improvement. I mean, it's, yeah, you can do something more. So what you can do is Load the image from U-Booth, right? So uh, restoring from hibernation is just copy pages into RAM from your swap partition, but this is what actually U-Boot does, right? Uh, and, uh, but there is a lot of things that U-Boot doesn't know. First of all, it doesn't know um, uh, the software suspend binary, right? To invoke actually the software suspend. It doesn't know the initial address to jump and starting loading the, uh, loading the image. And more, it doesn't know uh, something that is called no save pages. So when you go into suspend, there are some pages that you don't save. They're not necessary for, you, you don't need them. And the kernel knows about those pages and the U-boot does not. So you gotta do a pre-loading stage where you have to teach U-boot how to skip what is the length what is the start and the end, addre end address of the uh, no loading pages? Um, so you need some uh, modification of the kernel code, modification on the uh, U-boot code, and uh, one important contribution was done a time ago by uh, Russell Deal uh, from uh, TI. He was working, so the IMAX 8M is a 64-bit platform, and so there is an, a part that is an assembly code that takes care exactly of uh, the uh, CPU resume function that has to be passed to U-Boot that has to be rewritten for 64 bits. But you know, there is a lot of things that uh, are, has been um, pointed out by, by Russell that are really, really helpful to guide you on, 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 this, um, on this stage. So if it, this works, you can save other, uh, and we are, so right now I don't have a result to show you, so we did a kernel and we are, you know, um, pretty happy with this because we still can do system uh, that uh, boot in 12 seconds. We can probably reduce another two seconds or three seconds. That, it's a guess, right, Eric? So it's a guess, it depends in because we tried, we did some tests, there was some loading issues, so the, the loading stage was taking too, too much long, so we were like losing all the, uh, advantage of, of having U-Boot now in the picture. Uh, and so there is still things to clear a little bit and polished and, and try to actually have a eight second 
right boot uh, loading everything from the bootloader uh, from the bootloader uh, stage. Um, so this is everything for today. So I guess that I am uh, on time. Yeah, I am on time. Um, if you have any question, I hand you the microphone because the session has been recorded, okay? So any question? No question, okay. <laughs> oh, one question. Have you had to handle secure boot with the U-boot method, or did you find any ways to do that? Okay, so uh, the question was, if I was using secure boot, that is, um, you're talking about NXP secure boot, right? Okay, so um, secure boot is like a way to uh, trust the bootloader because you um, store uh, the keys of the, you sign the bootloader and you store keys on the fuse, on the fuse bits of the SOC, right? So we did not, the, the, we did not do that because um, it's really, first of all, is really um, a use case that is difficult to debug. If something goes wrong, you lost the, the SOC. Um, there is way to do some tests, of course, but um, theoretically, uh, because you are not changing, you're just patching the U-boot for supporting some loading stuff, it should be independent from this mechanism. So it should not be any, again, the testing may be a little bit harsh, but not, not impossible at all. So, of course, we are doing secure booth right now for some customers, and uh, not for many. Many customers are okay with the Android um, chain of, you know, trust, in, if, we call, if you want to say that, so the Android secure booth, uh, I mean the um, verified boot, right? And the um, SE Linux and the Mverity. So you have in Android already built in some security like um, features that sometimes on Android they are enough for giving the, the system a, like a solid. But yes, this is a very important part that we have to, we have to test. And it's not documented at all, by the way. So. <laughs>